to the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 52. Read the last two questions and answers, 128 and 129. How dost thou conclude thy prayer? For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. That is, all these we ask of thee, because thou being our King and Almighty, art willing and able to give us all good. And all this we pray for, that thereby not we, but thy holy name may be glorified forever. What doth the word Amen signify? Amen signifies, it shall truly and certainly be. For my prayer is more assuredly heard of God, and I feel in my heart that I desire these things of Him. Beloved, prayer has an address at the beginning, our Father which art in heaven. And prayer, as Jesus taught us to pray, has a conclusion. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And this conclusion is a doxology, a word of praise, is not simply tacked on at the end of the prayer, but rather it gives a reason for the entire prayer and for each of the individual petitions which we have already uttered. Because it begins with the little word for, which means because. Hallowed be thy name, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thy kingdom come, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thy will be done, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Give us this day our daily bread, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, for because thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for because thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. To put it another way, if gods are not the kingdom and the power and the glory, there is no point in opening our mouths and uttering a single petition of the Lord's prayer. Prayer presupposes that to God belong the kingdom and the power and the glory. Thus, the Lord's Prayer is a beautiful, harmonious whole. A prayer that Jesus Christ himself has taught us. And the prayer comes back full circle to where it began. We began with our Father, which art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, and at the end we ascribe glory to the name of our God. With this doxology, with this conclusion, we finish our treatment of the Lord's Prayer. And we finish our treatment of the Heidelberg Catechism. And what a fitting way to end the Heidelberg Catechism. We have seen through 52 Lord's Days our misery, our sin, our deep, terrible predicament in which we have fallen because of our sin. We have seen the way in which our God has graciously delivered us from that misery. That is the lengthy second part describing in detail what God has done in saving us through Jesus Christ. And we have seen in the third section how we are to show our gratitude for deliverance from that misery. Two ways. 
obeying the Ten Commandments and praying the Lord's Prayer. And now we conclude the Lord's Prayer and our treatment of the Heidelberg Catechism by praising God. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Consider then prayers concluding doxology. Prayers concluding doxology. Notice first it is an act of worship, then a confession of God's exclusivity, and third an expression of confidence. The Lord's Prayer does not end with a seventh petition after the six petitions we have looked at so far, but rather it ends with a doxology. The word doxology comes from two Greek words, doxa meaning glory and logos meaning word. So it's a word of glory or an expression of praise. You can see the difference between a petition and the doxology by comparing the first petition with the doxology itself. The first petition is, Hallowed be thy name. May thy name be hallowed. We're making a request. At the end we say, Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. We're not making a request. We are rather stating a fact. God's is the kingdom. God's is the power. God's is the glory forever. That's our final doxology. And so this final doxology is a mirror image really of the opening address and beautifully complements it. Because we begin by saying, Our Father which art in heaven. And at the end we confess that our Father who is in heaven has the kingdom and the power and the glory. And that of course is the great comfort that is ours in the Lord's Prayer. Because to whom belongs the kingdom? And to whom belongs the power? And to whom belongs the glory? But our Father which art in heaven. Just imagine if someone else had the kingdom and the power and the glory. If man had the kingdom and the power and the glory. Or if the devil had the kingdom, the power and the glory. Or even if they had some of the kingdom, the power and the glory. Where would our comfort be then? But our Father is in heaven. He sits upon a throne. He wields the scepter because his is the kingdom. Our Father is in heaven. He possesses all might and all power. He performs his will, always performs his will. He has an almighty stretched out arm which he employs, as it were, for the good of his church because his is the power. And our Father, who sits on his throne in heaven, surrounded by angels who adore him all the time, is splendid, radiant, magnificent. His virtues shine forth from his own infinite being, because his is the glory. And that's really the subject of Psalm 115. Psalm 115 is an extended doxology to God. We don't know the exact occasion when this psalm was written. We don't even know who wrote it. The title does not tell us that. But we know it happened at a time when Israel was in some distress. And they were crying unto God to intervene, to help not for their own sakes, but for the sake of the glory of God's name. Verse 2 tells us, 
that the heathen were saying in a mocking and sarcastic and sneering tone, Where is now their God? Where is Israel's God? Where is this great Jehovah who has done all these wonderful works in the history of Israel? And where is he now? Ha ha, they're saying. They are mocking Israel's God. In the history of Israel, the heathen have quaked in terror before Israel's God. But now, all of that has been forgotten. It seems as if Jehovah has run out of power and he's no longer acting on behalf of his people. And this, of course, is intolerable for the godly in Israel. Not so much that they are being persecuted, but that God's name, God's name is being dragged through the mud. And so, there's one petition in this psalm, and it's hidden, you could say, in verse 1. Unto thy name give glory. Put away the other words and get to the heart of it. Unto thy name give glory. That's the chief concern of the psalmist. Not that he is being persecuted, but that God's name is not receiving the glory that it must. We are not so important, O oh Lord. If we perish, it doesn't really matter. But our name isn't important. But your name, O oh God, is important. And because God has, as it were, tied himself, bound himself by a solemn oath to his people, if God's people are not delivered, then it looks bad upon the name of God. God's very truth is at stake if Israel is not delivered. And so, verse 1 ends with, For thy mercy and for thy truth's sake, that word truth could be translated, faithfulness, for thy mercy and thy faithfulness sake, God has promised to be the God of Israel. And for the sake of his truth, and for the sake of his mercy, Israel is asking God to save them. To arise and show himself to be the God that they know that he is. And then they will praise him. Verse 17 says, The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we, that is to say, the living members of the church on earth, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. So three things are ascribed unto the one true God in this final doxology, and they give us Three incentives, really, to pray in general, and three incentives to utter each individual petition. The kingdom, the power, and the glory. And notice how the Heidelberg Catechism makes this personal. It does not say the king, but rather being our king. God, you see, exercises his kingdom and his power and shows forth his glory, not in an abstract way, but through his people for the sake of Jesus Christ. He shows his kingdom by ruling his church. He shows his power by saving his church. He shows his glory by redeeming his church in Jesus Christ. The kingdom, remember, is his spiritual rule of grace in the hearts of his people and their elect children, making them willing subjects of Jesus Christ. And that kingdom is founded upon the blood of the cross of Christ. 
and that kingdom comes to visible expression in the world, in the Old Testament, in the kingdom of Israel, and today in the church, the church of all ages, Old Testament and New Testament, is the manifestation of the kingdom of God. And God's power, of course, is his ability to do everything which he has purposed to do. And again, that power is not used abstractly, but rather in and through Jesus Christ and his church. God showed himself to be almighty, to be powerful in Jesus Christ, in sending his Son into the world in human flesh, and in his Son, dying on the cross <coughs> to deliver us from our sins and thus by the resurrection conquering death and hell and the devil and so when Jesus Christ looked at his weakest he was at his strongest he was pulling down upon himself on the cross the infinite wrath of God, he was bearing under that wrath and he was exhausting that wrath for us so that that wrath will never touch us. And no one but God in human flesh could do that. And God's glory is the radiant shining forth of all of his perfections so that he is admired by all of his creatures and never was God glorified more than in Jesus Christ. Christ remember came for the purpose of glorifying the Father and every waiting moment he glorified the Father by his words, by his deeds, in his thoughts, he glorified his Father. He glorified his Father especially in obeying him even unto the death of the cross and then in the glorious resurrection on the third day. And he glorifies the Father by showing the manifold wisdom, power, righteousness, holiness, mercy, and love of God. And God glorifies himself even today, by calling sinners out of darkness and transmitting them into the kingdom of his Son. God is nowhere more glorified than in the salvation of his people. And that salvation must glorify him because it is all of him. Man doesn't lift a finger to save himself. Man doesn't contribute anything to his salvation. And so all the glory goes to him. That's also the idea in Psalm 115, especially as the psalmist contrasts the glory and kingdom and power of God with the miserable idols of the heathen. The heathen are sneering, where is now their God? And the heathen sneer today as well when they see the world falling around us. When earthquakes strike, when there's a disaster of monumental proportions in the world, the heathen are still sneering today, where is God in all of this? Where is your God now, Christians? And the answer that we must give is the same answer that Israel gave in Psalm 115, in verse 3. But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Our God is not crawling about on the ground, in the dust. He's in the heavens. He has the kingdom and the power and the glory which he exercises from heaven. And none of the gods of the heathen, whether they be Baal or Zeus, or whether they be the modern gods of money or pleasure, they cannot do one single thing to help those who worship them. 
They look nice, says the psalmist. They're made of the most precious of metals, verse 4. Their idols are silver and gold. They have all the parts. They have eyes and they have noses and they have mouths and they have hands and feet. They look wonderfully well carved, decked out, glorious in a certain sense. But they are nothing. What good is a silver leg if you cannot walk? And what good is having a diamond for an eye if you cannot see? And so you see in this psalm that these idols are inactive. They don't do anything because they are not God. And therefore it is vain, utterly useless to pray unto such a God in a time of trouble. It is useless to trust in such things. Useless to trust in a false god. Useless to trust in money. Because money can very easily take wings and fly away. Money can collapse. The economics of this world seem sometimes on the brink of collapse. One day you might have a large figure on your online bank account. Tomorrow it might be worthless because of the money markets or because of taxation changes or inflation. These things will do you no good when you come to die. Money, pleasure, these things are worthless. And the idols that the psalmist could see, worshipped by these sneering heathens, they could not even see those who are worshipping them because they cannot see. They can't hear the prayers or the songs of praise of their worshippers. They can't smell the incense when the worshippers come to offer the incense. They can't even handle the offerings that these people put on their outstretched arms. They can't even move. They have to be carried about by those who worship them. They can't help themselves, so how in the world can they help those who trust in them? They cannot speak either. They've never spoken a single word. They can't even mumble. The Hebrew word there, speak through their throats, is the idea of mumbling or grumbling, making low noises from their throat. They can't even do that. How can they, therefore, give promises to their people, as Jehovah gives gracious promises to his people. How can they threaten judgment? They can't even do anything. They do nothing. They can do nothing. They are nothing. In contrast to all of that, Jehovah is the God who acts, who does, who is busy doing. He is in heaven. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Verse 15. He hath made heaven and earth. Verse 12. The Lord hath been mindful of us. The idols are even aware of those who worship them. But God has been mindful. He has remembered them in his love and in his mercy. And the Lord, he will bless us. Idols cannot bless, and idols cannot curse. And the only reason, of course, that God can do these things for his people is because his is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. His is the kingdom now and will always be the kingdom. No one is going to come and rest the kingdom out of the hands of Jehovah God. And he does not share his power with anyone else either. That, of course, was the idea of idolatry of the heathen in the Old Testament, even in the New Testament. The idea being that you have a God of this, and a God of the other thing, and a God of the third thing, and so you must try and please all the gods at once. Bring an offering to this God if you want a good harvest. Bring an offering to this God if you want to have a child. Bring an offering to this God if there's a war on the way. No. Jehovah is the one universal king over all the earth. 
And if he blesses, and if he is mindful of us, no one can curse us, and no one can harm us, because he is God over the weather, over the harvest, over war, over famine, over absolutely everything. And in fact, so exclusive are Jehovah's kingdom, power, and glory that all other kingdoms, powers, and glories are derivative. Derivative means they come from him. They come from elsewhere. If a king has an earthly kingdom for a while, say Nebuchadnezzar had an earthly kingdom for a while, he has that kingdom because God gave it to him for a while. And that king, Nebuchadnezzar, as mighty as he might appear to be, is answerable to Jehovah who gave him that kingdom and must give account to Jehovah of how he ruled as king in his temporary small kingdom. And the same is true for power. If a person has power, even the power to lift his arm, that power came from Jehovah. The devil himself cannot even move except he has power from Jehovah. And no one has glory but Jehovah because Jehovah will not share his glory with anyone. That's what we mean by exclusivity. It belongs exclusively, only, entirely to him. And because that is true, those things, kingdom, power, and glory, do not belong to us. They are not ours. That must be our confession. And if it's not our confession, we shouldn't be praying. Because if we believe that the kingdom belongs to us, and the power belongs to us, and the glory belongs to us, we don't actually need to pray. We have everything we need. We must humble ourselves in our prayers, and we must confess that everything belongs to God, and nothing belongs to us. And if we have anything, it's because God has graciously given it to us. Our motivation in prayer must always be not our own glory, not our own comfort, not our own well-being, ultimately, but it must be the glory of God. That's what the Catechism says. All this we pray for, that thereby not we, but thy holy name may be glorified for ever. Not our name, not us, but thy name. And so every petition we pray with that idea in our minds. We pray, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil, so that God's name, not ours, God's name, be glorified. Because as we confess as reformed believers, God's glory is the highest purpose for all things. Our very existence serves the glory of God. God made this world in order to glorify himself. If God had seen in his own infinite wisdom that this world would not glorify him, he would not have made it. But God will be glorified, and God is glorified in every creature that he has made. Whether it be a bug on the ground, a mighty mountain, or a wicked, unbelieving man. We 
glorify God by being trophies of his grace to the praise of his mercy forever. On the last day, God will display us before the world. Do you see these people? Do you see how sinful they are in themselves? Do you see how powerless they were to save themselves? I have taken them and I have saved them, not for their own sakes, ultimately, but for mine, to glorify myself. And the wicked, they will glorify God as well. In a different sense, they will be a display of his righteous judgment and wrath. He will show them off on the last day too. These people, how wicked and sinful they are. They deserve what they are going to receive at my hand. My wrath, my justice will be glorified in them. That, of course, is why Psalm 115 begins the way it does. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory. That is a beautiful, humble confession that we should take upon our lips. The child of God should be horrified at the very idea of robbing God of even one tiny bit of his glory. Perish the thought that any glory would come to us. We have done nothing, we are nothing, we deserve nothing of ourselves. We must confess, God planned our salvation before the foundation of the world. In his eternal decree, he set his love upon us for his glory. God accomplished our salvation by sending his son who lived his whole life in obedience to God and then offered himself as a sacrifice to God for God's glory. And God works salvation in us by his Holy Spirit and keeps us by that same Holy Spirit to the very end so that not even the devil himself can snatch us from the hand of Jesus Christ. Not us, not unto us, not because of my works or my free will or anything that I have done that makes me different from other people upon the earth. Not unto us, but unto God give glory. And that's our confidence too. Our confidence as we come to pray to God is that His is the kingdom. His is the power. And His is the glory. And we know that the one to whom we pray is therefore able and willing to give us what we need. Notice, because thou being our King and Almighty art willing and able to give us all good. We do not have to, like the old idol worshippers of Baal, try to scream and jump up and down and cut ourselves with knives and lances to try and get our God's attention because he already desires to bless us more than we even desire his blessing. He is ready and willing to give us all things. And we do not approach him as a stern and a terrible judge, but as our loving and our wise and our good Father. And nor must we be worried that there are some things that this God, our Father, cannot do for us because they're too difficult for him. His is the kingdom. He rules over everything. 
So nothing can stop him from doing what he wills to do. After all, verse 3 says, He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. And it's his forever. No one's going to take it from him. The devil might seek to make a rival kingdom. A man might gather themselves together and finally form the anti-Christian kingdom under the Antichrist himself. But that doesn't make a particle of difference to the fact that it is God who possesses the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And in fact, God simply laughs, Psalm 2, at all of these feeble efforts of man and the devil to make a kingdom, power, and glory against him. And that's why we end our prayer with that word, Amen. What doth the word Amen signify? Well, the word Amen comes from a Hebrew word which means to be firm, to be strong, to be stable. Something which is unshakable, really. And therefore it means it shall truly and certainly be. It shall truly and certainly be. Amen is not simply the end of a prayer. The sign that, okay, we can open our eyes because we finished praying. Or the end of the sermon. Amen is a meaningful word. Often that word is translated in the New Testament where Jesus says, Verily, verily. The Greek has Amen, Amen. Verily, verily. And so you cannot utter the word Amen with a heart full of doubt. Amen is the opposite of doubt. Amen is certainty. Amen is faith. With Amen, we cling to the promises of God. We have studied what God has promised us in the Gospel. We know what God has promised to give us. We know what He will be pleased with when we ask Him. And therefore, we are assured that He will respond to us. My prayer is more assuredly heard of God than I feel in my heart that I desire these things of Him. And so we end our prayer. And so we end the Heidelberg Catechism with Amen. And so we end with that beautiful confession of Psalm 115, verse 1. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory, for thy mercy and for thy truth's sake. Amen. So let it be. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee that thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Help us, O Father, to live always in this consciousness and always to humble ourselves before thee and ascribe all the kingdom and the power and the glory to thy great name. For Christ's sake. Amen. Amen.